Hello, my friends. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Lisa Lewis, and I love this episode so friggin' much. Um, it's just a great conversation. I'm so excited to share it with all of you. I mean, I'm always excited, but I'm like extra excited today because I think that what Dr. Lewis and I talk about in this conversation is just one of the most important kind of missing pieces of the fitness industry at least the fitness industry that I'm part of and that I know. Uh, but before I dive into that, <laughs> uh, Dr. Lisa Lewis is um, is a licensed psychologist and a certified addictions counselor. Uh, she does a lot in sports psychology and counseling, but most important to all of you for this conversation is she works a lot with fitness professionals. In fact, we've hired her at Mark Fisher Fitness and at, uh, at Unicorn Society, our business of unicorns group. Um, and she does personal professional development with fitness professionals around their communication skills, their motivational skills. And that's really where our conversation starts in this podcast. We cover two main topics. We talk primarily, the first half is about motivation. What is motivation? How should you be thinking about motivation? Uh, wow, that was a tongue, tongue twister. How should you be thinking about motivation as a helping professional, as a fitness coach, a nutrition coach, as a business owner who manages a team? How should you understand motivation? And she gives a great framework for understanding motivation. She gives some great tips for how to um, help better motivate your clients and your teams. So it's a great conversation. I think she did her doctoral thesis on motivation. So I, there's no one better to be having this conversation with. It's fantastic. Yeah, there's both great frameworks and great practical takeaways. And in the second half, we really talk about boundaries and boundary setting, which is useful no matter what your life looks like. <laughs> it's useful in a professional setting for helping articulate your needs and wants. It's also useful to understand how boundary setting works when working with your clients. Um, but it's a great conversation about how we how we approach self-care as helping professionals. Um, so I gush a lot about Dr. Lewis in this whole conversation, and <laughs> it's all warranted because I think her work is so great and so important. Um, so please, share this episode with people you work with on your team um, if you have a team because I think learning these communication skills these self-care skills these motivational skills are so important to getting our clients results and having thriving fitness businesses so um, this, this intro has already been long enough because I'm so gushy about this conversation but I hope you enjoyed as much as I did I enjoy this conversation with the amazing Dr. Lisa Lewis <music> Hello, fitness business nerds. What's up? Welcome to another episode of Business for Unicorns podcast. And today I'm really stoked to speak to someone who I've actually gotten a chance to, to work with and hire for things multiple times, Dr. Lisa Lewis. Um, she's a freaking genius. She's come and spoke to at our Unicorn Society retreat. She's uh, spoken to our MFF team, I think more than once. And so I'm clearly a huge fan and I can't wait for all of you to get to know her and get acquainted with her and take her courses and follow her because um, I'm such a fanboy of, of Dr. Lewis. So without further ado, let's welcome her to the virtual stage here. Dr. Lisa Lewis, welcome. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for coming and being here. And as you heard, and as you already know, because I've told you this many times, I'm just such a fan uh, of like the work you do and your approach and your style. Um, you're just such a great teacher, you know, which I think is it's hard to find these days, especially for the topics that you teach. And so I'm so excited to just kind of share your brain and your experience with our listeners and viewers today. So thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure for sure. Yeah. So um, oh, there's so many places we can start. Let's just do this because, you know, you're not my kind of typical guest of a gym owner. You just start by talking. They'll heard, heard your bio, but just talk a little bit about your work. How do you how do you talk about the work that you do uh, these days? Mm -hmm. Well, how I always start is to say that I'm a therapist by trade. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is really the lens through which I have a lot of different balls up in the air. So I got my master's degree in clinical psychology in 2003, and I worked as a master's level clinician in a lot of different areas of mental health, working with people who were, had mental illness, so who were kind of sick. And then I went back to school and got my doctorate in counseling and sports psychology, and counseling psychology has more to do with helping anybody, whether they're mm -hmm. sick or well and want to get better and mm -hmm. working with athletes, of course, in sports psych. So I have been working with people um, in one-to-one -one conversations or in groups, helping them to talk about and make change in their life in one form or another since 2003. So now what I do is I have a private practice, probably 50% of those people in my private practice are athletes, executives, high achievers, 
folks who want to either improve something that's going well in their life or work on something they're having a hard time with. I also have a substance abuse specialty. So I work with a lot of people who identify as having an addiction. Um, then I've been teaching for a while at Northeastern University. I just gave that up and started working at a startup company for digital health where I'm the director of behavioral sciences. Oh, wow. And that's kind of a, a new project. Yeah. Where there's that's a lot exciting. of opportunities. Yes. For leadership and decision making and actually having uh, a very important say in how to help people access mental health resources, regardless of how well they're functioning. And then finally, I do stuff like this, which is operate in the fitness industry as a psychological consultant and help people who own gyms or who coach people learn how to motivate, how to facilitate change, how to take good care of themselves, and how to have a psychologically minded business. Mm. Oh, I love that. That's so great. I mean, I think most of this podcast is me just going to be gushing about you. It's going to be a big commercial. It's a Dr. Lisa Lowe's commercial because my head will get bigger and bigger. Yeah. <laughs> because you know, that's a, those are exactly the things we've hired you for to come to Market Your Fitness and our Unicorn yes. Society and talk about are things like yeah. how to set boundaries. We're going to cover some of these topics today. Things like how to set boundaries, how to have an organization that is psychologically minded about people's own uh, mental health at work. Um, and you know, let's start with a big topic that I know covers a lot of the, the work that you do. And I think it's a topic with a lot of misconceptions, which is motivation. I feel like I've heard, I've read so much over the years and obviously there's a lot of, there's a lot of kind of armchair psychology out there and Instagram psychology out there <laughs> about motivation, a lot of myths. So just talk to me generally about how do you think about how motivation works? Yeah, motivation is, my jam. It's what my dissertation was about. It's yeah. one of my central passions. It's one of the reasons I got interested in psychology as a kid is I love thinking about what makes people tick. Mm -hmm. And the frame that I use to think about it is to think about the whole person and to think of them as a constantly evolving person who has an innate desire to grow, to change, to, to um, evolve who they are. And a theory that I really like is the self-determination theory, as you know. Yep, yep. And the reason I like that is because there's a basic assertion that people want to improve themselves and that they already have possession of all the motivation they need inside of them. Yep. But what they need help with is accessing it, organizing it, leveraging it, and persisting with it over time. And that's where coaches can really make a difference. I think one of the places where coaches, well-intentioned coaches take a wrong turn is by thinking that they need to infuse their clients with motivation. They need to motivate their clients yep. by giving them their own internal resources or um, by making them have it. And unfortunately, all that will do is suck the life and the energy out of the coach. <laughs> yep. And for some clients, they'll just continue to take that in because it feels nice, but it won't actually help them to make their own change yeah. in their life. So self-determination theory is really about how can you identify what is making your clients tick? What is motivating them? What do they care about? Where do the values lie? And then how can you use communication, reinforcement, and the rapport and the relationship to help leverage whatever it is they have? And then as you are working with them to leverage that and to use that so that they're directed in their goals and they're actually moving forward, you will help them develop more motivation. You will actually enhance, help them to enhance their motivation because they're doing it. They're doing what they said they were going to do. And as we all know, when we start doing something that we want to get after and that we aspire to, it's very, very motivating. Yeah. 100%. Well, I love that you you just phrase it like that because I'm sure that every person listening who's ever um, coached someone, uh, you physically coached someone, <laughs> or even you know life coaches, nutrition coaches, they all get they all get this concept. Yep. Which is you know those clients that after you're done with them, you feel exhausted, and you often describe them as the ones that they don't really want to be here. They have really low energy. You know, I can't get them to do anything. They don't seem to be paying attention. You know, and then you wind up trying to overcompensate for that, doing black backflips for them, trying to motivate them and cheerlead them and all those things. And yeah. it is I've seen it be the fastest 
most direct path to burnout that exists. <laughs> yep, burnout <laughs> for the coach yep. and no success for the client. Yeah, it okay. makes no impact on them. You're doing back clicks like a like back back flips like you know like a dancing monkey or something, and they're just like no impact. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. what I'm hearing you say is <clears throat> you can't give it to them. You gotta you gotta get it out of them. Right? You have to find where it is. Um, yes. So can you just say a little bit more, because I know there's a, a few kind of categories in uh, self-determination theory that I think might be places where people can hang on to for understanding how people are motivated. Um, do you want to explain some of those? Sure. Um, so the way to think about motivation is like a spectrum. Mm. It's not to think about it like it's one tank, that you have one sort of fuel tank of motivation and it's either high, low, or empty. Yep. but that there are different buckets or different tanks, different ways that people are motivated. And the ones that keep, we're all most familiar with are the ones at the ends of the spectrum. So one end of the spectrum is no motivation, a motivation. If there are folks who are a motivated, they are not coming to see you, they are not DMing you, they are not asking for your <laughs> services, they are at home on the couch and they are happy to watch Netflix. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not joining your gyms in the first place. <laughs> no, they're not. The other end of the spectrum is intrinsic motivation, which is kind of this like idealized standard. And in sports and in sports psychology, there's a lot of folks, a lot of athletes who are intrinsically motivated because sports are kind of intrinsically motivating. And what intrinsic motivation means is there is no other motive other than the internal state that gets created. So your sense of being like in flow or being joyful or kicking ass, like that's intrinsic motivation. Now, unfortunately, a lot of exercise and training does not feel joyful for <laughs> lots and lots of people, yep. especially novices and beginners and people who are just starting out, who for many of you are who you're targeting to bring into your gyms. Yeah, 100%. So those two ends of the spectrums, you know, are not them. So in the middle, we have different forms of extrinsic motivation. And I think extrinsic motivation has caught a bad rap because people think of it as being like doing something for something outside yourself. And that's not wrong, but there is nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you, let's think about these points in the middle of the spectrum, starting at the low end. So there's not motivated at all. And then there's external reward. And that's that basic Skinnerian idea of behaviorism, which is I'm going to do something to get a reward or to avoid a punishment. Yeah. So I'm not going to do my taxes because of the joyful state that it creates when I do it. I'm going to do it so the IRS leaves me alone, yep. right? Or I'm going to, there are some programs that employers have where if you walk a certain amount of steps, maybe you get points or you get a gift card yep. or maybe at some gyms you get like pizza if you come to the gym so many times. That's an external reward, yep. right? So the the what's good about that and what anybody who's listening knows if you are a parent or a pet owner is that reinforcement and giving reward and encouragement helps to shape behavior it helps to get it off the ground mm -hmm. right does it have long-term staying power no and the reason why is once somebody starts doing a habit and they start doing a behavior they get more reward out of it than just that external token or prize they get what they start to do is feel like, ooh, I did that, like self-esteem <laughs> or pride. So think about that next bucket. If you move along the spectrum a little further, it's a little bit more internalized, still an extrinsic motivation. It's called introjected regulation. What that means is the motivation is kind of internalized, but you're kind of getting it from the outside. So this means feeling proud of yourself or feeling fabulous mm -hmm. after you do your workout or you do your week of like great nutrition or wanting to avoid feeling guilty or shameful or bad for not doing it. So this sure. is people who are like, I was thinking about a piece of pizza all day long, but I really wanted to stick with my no snacking thing. So I just like pushed through because I knew I would feel terrible about myself. Mm -hmm. That's interjected regulation. And you can hear that with people and toddlers once they start doing a behavior and they stop doing it or they skip a day or so it's good, 
but again, it doesn't have staying power. One of the sure. ways I've heard this described over the years is like the Catholic guilt motivation. <laughs> and no offense to anybody who's Catholic, I was raised Catholic, so I feel like I have license to say that. I'm, I'm sure as you said it, you get a lot of nodding heads, like, yep, okay, we got you. Yeah. yeah. And what all us Catholic knows is that only our Catholics know is that that only goes so far, mm -hmm. you know? So if you join the gym in January because you want to feel better about your body and, you know, you go for the first six or eight weeks because you want to feel good or you avoid feeling guilty, by the time you get to spring break, that probably is not cutting it anymore. 100%. Yeah. So what we want is to reinforce people so they feel good and proud, but also we want them to start identifying meaningful outcomes that are in alignment with their values. And that's the next book, Bucket of Motivation. So the more internalized next step of motivation is identified regulation. And this means I don't love running. I don't like kettlebell uh, swings. I don't really like weight training. However, when I do that stuff, my back doesn't hurt. I have more energy for my grandkids. My cholesterol has gone down. My blood pressure is more under control. And all that stuff really matters to me because I don't wanna die of heart disease before 60 like every other person in my family. I wanna set a good example for my kids and my grandkids, yeah. right? So, so, like, so this step what I'm hearing is that there's, there's an identification of goals that is kind of useful and yep. a kind of alignment with a recognition that this is something that aligns with my values, something that matters to me in my it life. It matters to me, yeah. right. It That's matters right. to me. Back when they were you know, externally regulated, they're like, I don't care. My cholesterol has been bad for 20 years. Everybody in my family has bad cholesterol, right? Yep. It's there's it's you're not tugging on anything. Yep. But I feel that one of the really important sweet spots in exercise and health behaviors is identified regulation. Mm -hmm. If we can educate people about outcomes and if we can help them to understand what the value they can get and what might how that might matter to them then you've got really good leverage and yeah. you people will do all kinds of stuff they don't want to do in the name of that outcome that's really valuable to them yeah well said that's a really clear description yeah keep, and then there's going. one more bucket yeah. uh and then i'll i'll uh, turn it back over no keep going yeah i think most people who are listening are going to identify with this bucket so it's it's the it's right next to intrinsic motivation and it's called integrated regulation. Integrated regulation means that you are motivated to engage in the behavior because it is integral mm -hmm. to your personality and your character. Mm -hmm. So if you think about people who like love tough mutter, <coughs> I always use them as the example because you ask them like, how was your last, last tough mutter? And they'll say, oh my God, it was 40 degrees and it was raining and I sprained my ankle and I dislocated my shoulder and it took six hours and I couldn't walk for three days. I loved it. I can't wait to do it again. Yep. <laughs> I yep. started for that. So you're like, it sounds like torture. You know, they were certainly yeah. not like in a state of joy while they were doing it, but training for it and signing up for it and wearing the t-shirt and doing it, all that stuff is really like baked into the crust of who they mm -hmm. are as a human being. Yeah. And if we can get people to get health related behaviors integrated into their personality and their lifestyle, then you've got persistence, you've got sustained behavior over the lifespan, and that is really awesome. Yeah. So I think for many people who are listening, you have that, like you don't just drink the Kool-Aid, like you are Kool-Aid, you know? <laughs> and so what's good about that is your behaviors are sustained and you know why it's so great to engage in these behaviors, but your clients who are just coming in, they don't, they've never even had a sip of that Kool-Aid. Mm -hmm. And so when, sometimes when coaches get burned out, they're like, I don't get it. Like, it's so, you feel so good when you eat right. It makes you feel so awesome when you hit a new PR, but they haven't taken all those steps to develop all these different buckets. You yeah. know, they haven't had an opportunity to evolve in that way, but you as the coach can help them. And the trick is to figure out where the motivation for them to train is coming from, like which bucket is full, which bucket are they coming to you with and how can you draw from that bucket and then help them progress to the next one. Yeah. Beautifully said. I love that. And you're you're absolutely right. I think, well, let's circle back to what the coaches can do more because I want to dig a little deeper there. But that last bucket, I think, falls in line with um, a phrase I often hear, which is which is something something to the effect, I forget the, what the quote is, I often hear something like, you know, good behavior change is really identity change, right? That if, if you get people and that last bucket really kind of speaks to that, right, is that it's fully integrated into who the person 
thinks they are. It's integrated into the narrative of how they describe themselves. You know, like, yeah. oh, like I'm a I'm a triathlete, or, you know, I'm a marathoner, I'm a biker, yeah. I'm a walker. You know, like <laughs> they describe themselves as a person who does that. It seems like exactly. It, yeah, which I think is is really beautiful when when that can happen. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. So um so I hope you all were taking notes because that was, you know, the way you described that spectrum, I think, was very vivid, very clear. And I think it's a great kind of teaching tool for our teams, you know, teams of coaches need to understand where people are on that spectrum. And so let's kind of pick up there where you were just kind of hinting to. I'll also say apologies in advance for everyone listening. I, I think there's my, my grass is being cut. So you might be hearing some lawnmowers and weed whackers in the background, but it'll end shortly. Um, so let's just pick up where you left off. So um us as people who run gyms, you know, one of the jobs that you're saying here is our coaches should understand that spectrum. And the first step, I think you said earlier, is helping people uh, understand where they're at on that spectrum and articulate maybe what their goals and values might be to help. Try. So is, is that a, a, a fair way to describe like a first step? Yes, I think, and you're probably most of your listeners get that data somehow, either yeah. in verbal communication or email, or if there's some kind of like intake form, you know, yeah. what's bringing you into the gym. Yep. And they'll respond to that. And then what do you want out of this so, or mm -hmm. goals or, so yeah. you can, you can get a lot out of that information. Even if they say something like, I hate exercise, but my wife says I got to lose 30 pounds and <laughs> improve my blood pressure. So here I am. Yep. Well, if you hear that, that's external regulation, right? That's yep. like, I'm going to get in trouble with my wife if I don't come here. And so that gives you a starting point. Like, okay, they are here to avoid punishment or possibly incur reward. Yep. That's where, you know, and you want to learn more about that. If they say their goal is to get their blood pressure down or to lose 30 pounds, then, then you've got something to aim at with them. Not that you are thinking in a vacuum about, okay, what kind of program am I gonna write to get 30 pounds off them? No, but you heard them say, that's my carrot. That's mm -hmm. the thing that actually makes me care enough to email you or DM you or whatever. So as you are communicating with them, as you are going through programming, you can help them get back to that carrot or to access that bucket of motivation by saying, I know, you know, I know you're saying you really don't feel like doing your dynamic stretching and you really hate kind of some of the hinge, hip hinge movements we're doing. But what I'm thinking about is how to get that 30 pounds off you and keep it off. Mm -hmm. And so the, these exercises are part of making sure you don't get injured and sidelined, which is going to slow down your weight loss and how we're going to get you really stable and mobile so you can train hard and start to get that weight off. Yeah. So you're kind of connecting the dot back, even though in your mind, you're like, dude, everybody has to do their dynamic stretching and learn how to do a hip hinge. <laughs> you're not saying that because that's your motivation, right? Totally. Their motivation yes. is the blood pressure and the 30 pounds. So you're connecting those two things, providing that education for them to be like, all right, and to be yeah. compliant and to persist. That's it. And I think that, that it's, it's such an important skill that I think that just... It sounds so simple, but if more trainers did it, you'd have more success, more results, right? And I think way often I think of this when I do business coaching is that I'm just like a little sticky note for their goals and their values. Like I'm just a constant little reminder to be like, okay, well, you know, how would, what would you do next if you turn to your values for, for guidance? You know, what would you do next? You know, what are your priorities this week if this is really your goal like you told me it was, you know? Mm -hmm. But I'm constantly just reflecting back to them. This is what you told me is important to you in your life. This is what you told me you want to accomplish. Um, and that's my job, right? I, You know, my job isn't isn't to push them and nudge them and kick them and, you know, punch them into submission to do those things. It's to constantly remind them uh, to try and get their, to their behaviors, their actions, their energies, their attitude to align with those things they say they want. <laughs> and yeah. that is, that is, I feel like, much easier work to me than trying to, you know, force them into something that's on my agenda. Right. It's so much easier. And, and I think also the, the thing to underline is it is effective. Mm. Because it is often not effective to do your clients work for them. And what I, what I mean by that is not that you're physically picking up the weight, but psychologically. Sure. When you care more, when you're saying more, when you're trying to fill up their empty tank, you are depleting yourself and w whatever you're giving them is totally unsustainable. Mm -hmm. It's a non-renewable resource. Like, yeah. and in fact, you may be enabling them to care less. Yeah. And this is one thing, it's a little more subtle and a trickier dynamic to understand. But when I've done in-services before, 
with gyms, we kind of get into discussions about cases in ways that like clients will almost like provoke us or engage us to like give them positive affirmation and to encourage them and to kind of pump them up. But the more we do it, the more we don't like it and the less they actually do or the less they change. And it's a vicious cycle. Yeah, 100%. And it goes back to that old analogy. If you, you know, we want to teach them to fish, you know, not fish for them and then fillet the fish and then make it, make it a meal for them. Right? And if we we're constantly the one providing the motivation and the cheerleading and all of that, and they're not not getting, accessing any of that in themselves, that I feel like you're right, that we're not going to be as, as effective. And so yeah. that's really smart, which actually, you know, it leads to a really great um, next topic. Uh, which you kind of mentioned, which is about the coaches themselves or the team members themselves. Mm -hmm. So all, a lot of that was really about, you know, taking care of our clients, understanding their goals and, and values and motivation. Um, but something you, you came to MFF to talk about, which is so valuable, mm -hmm. is that other side, which is how do we set boundaries for ourselves and our relationships with our colleagues, with our work, with our clients, to make sure that we can show up to work as the best that we can possibly be <laughs> and not give too much and not give the wrong stuff, <laughs> not give all the things that make us burn out and stress out and not want to go to work every day. So um, let's just talk a little bit about boundaries. How do you how do you think about personal boundaries, especially in the workplace? Mm -hmm. So I think about personal boundaries the same way that I think about physical boundaries and probably in, in the in-service I provided for you guys and in others, I've kind of started by making reference to Dirty Dancing, where Patrick Swayze is yeah. talking about dance space. And exactly. sorry to anybody who's like a Gen Zer and is like, what the heck movie is that? Come on, go, that's your assignment. Turn off this podcast, <laughs> go watch Dirty Dancing, and then go nah, watch it. We yeah. can't be friends until that happens. And so he says, this is my dance space, this is your dance space. And there is something universally um, understood in that because everybody listening has been speaking to somebody who is a close talker and who comes into their personal space. And when somebody does that, you have a reaction. And then you've, you've been talking to somebody who's too far away or who's kind of emotionally distanced or not making eye contact. And you f kind of feel like, how do I like, <laughs> how do I get to you? So the same kind of visceral feelings and sense we have of what our dance space is, you have that wiring also for your emotional and communication, your personal and professional boundaries. Those, those boundaries, however, I think sometimes we lose our ability to like our radar for that because of trying to please other people or because of negative experiences that we've had in our life that has kind of messed up how we gauge that. So what I encourage people to do is figure out get familiar with what your own boundaries are because it, healthy boundaries exist along a spectrum. There are probably some people listening who are like pretty transparent, very animated, kind of would describe themselves as being open, who really care, who, who may feel like, you know, my boundaries might be more on the, on the fluid or open end of the spectrum. And I like hearing about my clients' personal lives and I like them knowing me and then there might be some folks listening who are like, no, thank you. I want to come to work. I want to do my job and I want to yep. leave. And I'm, I'm a pretty introverted private person. And both those things are okay. And everything in the middle is okay. What is important is to understand where you are. And then how do you, with compassion and with good communication, set those limits and then maintain them over time with your client? Because what occurs with many helping professionals that I have worked with over the years is that helping people, people helpers are really good at understanding what the other person needs and then bending or flexing or changing themselves to meet yeah. that need Absolutely. and sometimes lose sight of their own boundaries. So then folks get in a situation where they're like answering text messages and emails on like Sunday morning at 8 a.m. or Friday night at 10 p.m. or they're just giving themselves away feeling like I have to do this because of I need to retain my clients or I, you know, this is what they've come to expect from me, or this is what they could get if they go somewhere else. And I hear all those fears and I'm sure Michael, you hear them probably all the time from people. But, but the point is that if it's outside of what your comfort zone is and your natural boundaries, it is going to suck you dry and burn you out. 
And they're actually what I have found as a professional and what I think many other coaches and fitness have found is that people like boundaries. They like knowing what the limits are, what the structure is, what the rules are. And what you have to do is let them know that. And you can let them know that on your website. You can let them know that on your intake paperwork. You can let them know that at orientation and you can remind them with compassion at any point along the way. And that last part is the part that I think needs the most support. When I when I workshop things or talk about cases with, with fitness professionals, we talk about folks that it's like hard to set limits with or situations where their members have come to expect, you know, some level of giving that they really want to change. And then, okay, how can we change that? And you can. Um, it's just a matter of blending compassion and understanding with, respect for yourself and communicating that in an open way. Yeah, I'm so glad you said that, Lisa, because that is, uh, I have that conversation with someone at least once a week, right? Wow. <laughs> at least once a week, I'm having a conversation where we're like, well, this is what we've done with our members for 10 years. How could I possibly tell them that they have to arrive on time now for yeah. class sessions when they've been <laughs> arriving whenever the heck they want for 10 years? Yes. You know, yes. I, I hear these conversations all the time. And often the way I talk to people about this, I think this is aligned with what you're saying is often when the, the project of setting boundaries is often about making our implicit expectations explicit, right? Mm -hmm. Saying outside and communicating, getting in conversations with people that the ways we feel like we want to be treated on the inside, but have never said, <laughs> you know, or that haven't said That is so enough. true. Yeah. <laughs> haven't said and I love the way that you unpack that. And I also, my thought about that as you were describing it is, it is excellent, excellent role modeling for your clients. A hundred percent it is. Yep. Yeah. Anytime any professional in my life has good limits or they set, to, my reaction to it is not to be ruffled. Of course, I talk about this for a living, but my reaction is like, that's really awesome. You know, I went to see a PT last month and I got there five minutes early. I was the first appointment of the morning. I came in her waiting room. I knew she was back there, like in the back room. Mm -hmm. And she didn't come out until nine o'clock when the appointment started. And yeah. I was like, I just was like, good for her. You know, <laughs> she's not rushing out there to get me. Yeah. And actually in the appointment, she said something about it that she, and I was like, no, I really liked that. It was a good lesson for me because I feel that, oh, the, the clients here, I have to go attend to them. Yeah. Um, and she said, yeah, you know, I actually think I'm more centered and ready because I took my last couple of minutes and mm -hmm. prepared myself. Oh, so true. Good for her. Mm -hmm. Bravo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I, so I think, you know, one of the things I, I heard you say early on, you know, comparing it to kind of your physical space. And we all have this kind of feeling when someone gets too close. Well, frankly, if yeah. you live in New York City long enough, that kind of just goes away. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're just so used to someone's like, you know, elbow being in your armpit all day, you know, that, that's just uh -huh. like, but point taken. And, and it feels like those physical cues are kind of easier to understand, right? That feels like it's the, the, the signals, I'll speak for myself, the signals I get when my physical boundaries are being upset seem really loud and really obvious. And the kind of emotional ones or the less physical ones feel harder to access. Do you have any tips for people to understand like, you know, how they, or how to get more connected to where their boundaries might be if it's not clear mm. to them yet? Mm. Yeah. And so that's an excellent question. I think it's less clear because our society does not encourage us to really get familiar with that. Mm -hmm. And so we don't pay attention to the cues. And so they're less and less obvious yeah. to us. So the same way when you're training somebody and you, you ask a brand new client, like turn on your core, probably a lot of new people are really not doing it very well or fire your glutes, you know? Yeah. So you have to teach them how to do it and how to get feedback to let themselves know that they're actually doing it. And so I think the same, you can use the same example for your emotional boundaries, which means you begin by asking yourself about it and collecting some data about it. Yep. Um, or if something comes up and you're, if you don't like a client, if you're dreading them coming in, if you feel drained after they leave, that is data. Mm -hmm. And you might be doing one of two things, judging yourself. I mean, I don't like this person. I'm being what, you know, saying something's wrong to you or, oh, that person is X, Y, and Z and they're just not a good person. And that's why they're draining. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. So I guess you can do that. But what's more useful is to say, I wonder why that client is stirring up this reaction and what actually are these feelings? So identifying the feelings, I think naming them is important. So whether that's with a colleague or a partner or a friend, you want to verbalize like I feel X, Y, and Z. I feel tightness in my chest. I feel fidgety. I feel a little irritated. Could even, um, um, even journaling be a first step if you don't want to talk yet? Yeah. And there might be some, that's a great point, Michael. There might be some people listening who um, don't have a person to yeah, talk with about not that. For me to tell my colleague that I hate that client. Like it's just not, um, that's not, we don't have that relationship yeah. you know, yeah. yet. <laughs> and that's a really good point, you know, and another reason why I love being in the fitness space is because having a, a colleague or having supervision is part of training as a therapist. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I really hope can change is that in fitness, you, there's not that same like collegiality of it is important for me to talk about how I feel and what I think in yeah. order to be a good coach. Yeah. Um, because stuff is going to come up. There's going to be clients who rub you the wrong way or who try to take as much of your energy as they can or, you know, all of that. So I do think it's important to check out how you feel, identify how you feel in writing or verbally. I like verbally because I like the way that speaking helps people to organize their thoughts um, yeah. and make it real. But for some people listening, maybe writing would do the same thing. And then finally, what, what would feel better? You know, what would I, how, if I could wave a magic wand and change this client, what would I change about the client? Poof, to make the situation better. And that might give you an idea of how to set a limit. Like yeah. if the client just would not go on for 20 minutes about their ex-husband, <laughs> <Yep>. like <laughs> I would probably like them more. Okay. So is there a way you can help them with that? Yeah. You yeah. know, is there some way to set a limit or to kind of politely interrupt them um, that might help them to stop <laughs> so that the both of you can get more out of that session. Yeah, I think it's a really clear set of action steps. I'm just going to repeat what I think I heard for our listeners and viewers, right? Which is, which is number one, just kind of when you when you have that sense that something isn't right, I'm not completely thrilled with this relationship, this interaction, this client, this environment, that you just get curious about it, right? And dig a little deeper and be like, what actually am I feeling here? Can I name it? Can I, you know, write it down, have a conversation about it, communicate about it? Uh, and understand what actually is the thing that's making me not feel the best. <laughs> uh, and then obviously, then the, the second question I heard you say is then, is there something I can do about it? Is there something I can do to intervene and change this context or this relationship or whatever the thing is that's not working? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, sometimes that's going to be a really obvious solution, I'm guessing. And sometimes it's not obvious at all. And it's going to take some time to think about it. Maybe take some time to ask some friends for some support, <laughs> you know, turn to colleagues, mentors, friends. Um, therapists <laughs> and and you know maybe even role play what it might sound like uh, and frankly that's a lot of what I find I find myself doing on my coaching calls yes <laughs> practicing conversations that people are too yes to have which you know I'm so delighted to do because I know how invaluable that has been in my life and I think yes. um, boundary setting conversations are at the top of that list people get so nervous to ask someone to change something about the way things are working. Um, uh, where do you think that that nervousness comes from? You know, you know, because in some cases the stakes, from my perspective, don't seem that high. Sometimes <laughs> I was like, well, it's just a client. So, yeah, worst case scenario, you just don't have that client anymore, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But but there's something. There's some there seems to be something more at stake when people get nervous about having these boundary setting conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you think about that? I think about it as upsetting the relationship and yeah. putting the relationship in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. So we are designed to attach. And once a dynamic gets going of a, of a rapport and a reciprocity and a pattern, then both parties want to keep that up. Even if the dynamic is dysfunctional, it's still, dysfunction is still function, mm -hmm. right? It still works. Mm -hmm. So when you change a dynamic, you disrupt that and you put it in jeopardy. And so we, as, you know, as the helping professional, you are the holder, you are the manager of the relationship, you are in charge because a professional relationship is one directional, you know? So this is true of doctors, lawyers, therapists, coaches, you, you have ownership of that. So when you ask for a change, you are taking, and maybe it's just theoretical, maybe it's just emotional, but you are taking a risk. And I find often that people in helping positions 
have life experience and have had roles in their families where they are a people helper. Mm -hmm. They are a bender. They are someone who's really good at knowing what the other person wants and needs and they can feel that and they care about that and they're connected to that. And that's a superpower in a lot of ways. However, it makes the scariness of changing and asking for something and setting a limit increased. Yeah, so sure. I think that's good feeling that you're having. Like, this doesn't seem like it's, you know, that there seems to be a discrepancy between how big of a deal this really is and what it feels like. Mm -hmm. And that discrepancy is about the individual's personality, their yeah. feelings toward the situation, and probably their history of taking yeah. care of other people. I think that's really, I think that's right, Lisa. I think that's really well said. Because often when I do try and dig, be like, what, what makes this matter so much to you? There's something about their identity as someone who gets these relationships right. Yes. Right. There's something like, well, I'm a coach. I, you know, I've been doing this for so long. I should be good at this. I should be good at navigating these clients, et cetera. Well, you know where else I see this a ton? Mm. <laughs> that's a little bit of a tangent from what we've been talking about. But I see this a ton when it comes to employer-employee relationships, mm. where they're so afraid to ask the employee to change or so, oh, yeah. so afraid to ask the employee to to, to fire someone, frankly, right? But it goes back to what you said to me, which is even dysfunction is function, right? It's like, yeah. we always refer to it as it's the devil we know, you know? So I'm gonna keep with this employee who is really not working hardly at all, but I know how it doesn't work and I'm comfortable with how it doesn't work. <laughs> and I've learned how to pick up the pieces and the messes from when it doesn't work. So I'm gonna stick with this instead of going through the risk, the potential discomfort of getting acquainted with someone new <laughs> who might work even worse, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I see, yeah. that's that's what I see all the time. And I've obviously made that mistake many times. I was just hanging on too long to a relationship because um, it was the devil I know. Yeah. And, yeah. and we are not really designed for relationships to end. We yeah. all, you know, we have evolved to create relationships and stay in them. Mm -hmm. So if it feels hard to end a relationship, one, one way you can think about that is like, well, I have evolved. My brain, you know, structure and function has evolved to make that feel really unwanted. Yeah. So when you get into the, the devil that you know, and I'm, I'm willing to turn myself into a pretzel and do all these things, yep. you're doing that out of this like probably biological innate desire to maintain and preserve the relationship. Mm -hmm. and you can say to yourself, you know, I do I need this relationship for my survival? Will I be okay if the relationship ends? And what a lot of people probably say in whatever way you ask them is like, I'd probably be better off without this client. 100%, 100%. Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that the, I imagine the process for employers thinking about the employee relationships are actually very similar to what you mentioned before, I'm guessing, which is get curious about how do you feel about how things are going, right? See if you can excavate those feelings, understand mm. what's really going on, get in conversation about it, and then what could you do to change it? Is there something yeah. you can do to make it better? And I think that that, that process probably rinses and repeats for this kind of scenario as well. Am I right on that? Absolutely, because whatever your issues are in your life, that's the client who's gonna come walking in the door. You know, wherever your growing edges are, yeah. whatever's really hard for you to look at yourself about, that's the kind of stuff that's going to come up in your work and be hard to deal with. And every single one of those things are opportunities mm -hmm. to work on yourself or not, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, it's not that you have to seize every opportunity for growth and improvement, but whatever your learning edge is, that is going to come up in your work in some way. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Well, I could just keep talking to you all day, but we're right at the 40 minute mark. So, <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm going to uh, force myself to start wrapping up, even though I could ask 1 million more questions. Um, but before, before you go, let's do this. Um, I know that you have an amazing course, um, Psych Skills for Fit Pros. Can you just talk a little bit about what it is and how people can learn more? Because I think everyone listening should absolutely be taking this course. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, I created Psych Skills for Fit Pros because after a handful of years of working with gym staff or trainers doing in services, speaking at different um, conferences or seminars. Um, I realized that there was all of this content that really didn't exist in the field and that I could provide. And a couple colleagues of mine said, you really need to do a course. Mm. So I created Psych Skills for Fit Pros. Right now, volume one is what's out there in the world. And this summer I am creating volume two. Exciting. So volume one, yes, volume one, Psych Skills for Fit Pros, I believe is the foundations of 
what you need to know if you are a fitness professional or if you are in the, you know, the health, uh, health helping profession. And um, so volume one is worth 1.3 CEUs. So that's about 13 hours of content. Uh, it was approved by the NSCA and NASM for CEUs. Great. And what it includes are uh, three main topics. The first is the self-determination theory. So understanding motivation, those different buckets we talked about, mm -hmm. um, universal ways that folks are motivated. And then it really goes in depth for many hours on how to assess that. So we, we do sort of like mini case studies and then also examples of how you might respond to that, tailor your programming, your communication around that. The second chunk of um, important content there is the trans theoretical model, for the stages of change. So how people change, what that process is of change. I think that's very important because um, only about 20% of people are actually ready to take action mm. about and make change. And the other, you know, 80% of the people who are coming in are either thinking about it or they've just relapsed from something or they're planning, but they're not quite ready. And so that part is about understanding when your client comes in and you hear their goals and you hear their motives and you're getting to know them, how to hear where they're at in those stages of change. And as opposed to trying to change that because you can't, it's meeting them at that stage of change, mm -hmm. which might be taking action, but it might be planning and preparing. It might be educating. It might be supporting, you know, how can you understand that process and not take it personally when your client's not ready to change? Cause most people are not ready to change. Even if they come in your door and say, I am sign me up. <laughs> um, and, and so I think that really can help a lot with burnout and just rolling with people as they're moving along and whatever their process is. And then finally, the third core content in volume one is motivational interviewing, which is really the how to. So, you know, the stages of change and motivational interviewing are, are kind of kissing cousins. Sure. One is the theory of how this, how this looks. The other is skills for how it works. Motivational interviewing began in the addictions, which is when I became familiar with it back in the early 2000s and when I started mm -hmm. using it. But now it's, it's used in all kinds of behavior change. Um, including nutrition and fitness. Yep. And so we talk, that's a very applied set of modules and it, it really focuses on what to listen to your clients say and then what are things that you can say back. And what I like about motivational interviewing is it's not a script. It's mm -hmm. not some kind of um, program that you execute. It is, yeah. you tailor it to your own authentic way that it's, you. It's really a framework. It's like some guide posts to follow. You got it. Path in the woods, you know, like yeah. that's, that's exactly it. Yeah. I love motivational interviewing because it just takes the ownership of you having to change your clients right off the table mm -hmm. and makes it really about how to be a Sherpa or how to be a guide, how to help facilitate that change. And so in that curriculum, there are lectures, of course, and then I do interviews with different people who are in the field of fitness to hear from them. And Mark Fisher is yep. one of my interviewees about how he kind of integrates ideas around motivation and behavior change into yeah. working with clients and running a gym. Yeah, 100%. Well, I mean, uh, thank you for the work you're doing. I mean, if it hasn't been clear by my gushing already, I think this is just one of the most important skill sets we need in the fitness industry is more people who've taken psych skills for fit pros and know how to do some of these things. Not only will we be getting better results, but I think we'll have a, a better, more empathetic industry <laughs> when we can help yeah. meet people where they're at and guide them uh, lovingly with care, <laughs> with purpose, without burning out, you know, like mm -hmm. what, what more do we want? I mean, this, this, these skills are so essential. Also make this plug, which is, you know, absolutely all these skills are essential for getting clients results, which is important to our businesses. But I will sure. also say maybe the number one place we've applied this kind of learning that we've learned from you is in sales. Mm. Is kind of marketing and sales processes, right? Because it's, it's absolutely that moment where we're getting to know people, understand their goals, understand their values, understand how we are going to help guide them and pull out of them the things we need to pull out of them to get them where they say they want to go. Yeah, and that is a sales conversation, right? Absolutely. And so, <laughs> and so we have folded so many of these motivational interview skills and all the things we talk about in terms of motivation overall into how we understand that process. And so for any, you know, fitness entrepreneurs listening who are like, oh, enough of those mushy feelings, 
therapy stuff. Um, well, first of all, you weren't listening to the rest of this podcast, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but also, um, but also, even if you just want a strict ROI on this investment of your time or money, you'll get it in your sales. You will get it in converting more people because you'll be better. You'll be listening better, understanding where they're coming from better, able to, better able to meet them where they're at. And so you'll get the ROI, even if you don't care about the feelings. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and also, who are you? You're probably not listening to this podcast if you don't care about the feelings. <laughs> but you're bringing up a good point, which is that this is not just about making people feel good. It is about being effective. 100%. Like we have, you know, people join gyms and quit and start programs and drop off and try to change behaviors and stop all the, all time. the time. It is really hard to change and you are not going to make someone change. They're going to make themselves change and they need a lot of support, a lot of education, and they need to know that you get them. Mm -hmm. And that you're going to work with them and not just, you know, yeah. try to shuffle them along yeah. something that is on your own agenda. I'll add one more bonus to doing this work, which is our team themselves. You know, most fit pros have a long, a lifelong um, relationship with fitness and food that is complicated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in many ways, you know, more complicated than the clients we serve, because in many ways we people think it's my work, I should be good at that. This should be easier for me. I should, I should know what to do all the time. And I would say that, you know, our team is also better at people been able to better understand themselves by going yeah. through this work and, and thinking of themselves in the client seat. Um, and so there's just so many benefits. I could keep going, but making this podcast long enough. Uh, <laughs> but thank you for doing this work you do. And for those of you who want to go learn more about psych skills for, for fit pros, we'll include it down the, the links um, in the show notes down below. Um, so go check it out. Go work with Dr. Lisa Lewis. Um, and I hope to have you back again someday. So thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Hey friends, before you go, just one more thing. Um, if you enjoy this podcast, you get value out of it, you enjoy listening, please share this podcast, comment below. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe. Um, please share it with friends and family. We don't spend any money on marketing or advertising. And so um, so the only way people find out about this podcast is from you. So please do everything you can to share it with friends and uh, fellow colleagues in the fitness industry. Uh, we love making it and we want to keep doing it for a long, long time. So I appreciate your support. Go have a kick-ass day. Bye.